Hello and welcome. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. It's been so nice to see everyone's comments in the chat pod. Looks like we've got quite the global audience everywhere from Japan to Italy to the States. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you once again to today's discussion on cryptocurrency. In case you're joining us for the first time, extra special welcome. I'd also like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around today. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides that we're sharing. If you can't see them or have any other technical difficulties today, you can send us a text report request via email to milfamln at gmail.com. We'll pop that email address in the chat here in just a second for your convenience. As many of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversation, questions, and hellos. Do embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversation. Simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen, and then from there you can select the chat bubble icon. When typing any comments and questions, please be sure to select that all panelists and attendees, or perhaps it says everyone on your version of Zoom. Uh, this just ensures everyone who's on today's webinar can see those come through in the chat pod. We'll be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. Additionally, if you'd like to download a copy of the slides for today's webinar, you can find those on the event page, and we'll place that link to the event page in the chat again for your convenience. The Military Families Learning Network is a DOD, part of a DOD USD partnership for military families. And our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. It's my pleasure now to turn things over to my colleague, Selena Garrison. She's the program coordinator, coordinator with the MFL and personal finance team, and she'll be introducing our speaker team today. Selena. Thanks, Coral. Good morning, everyone. We are joined today by Dr. Chris Wilmer and Mr. Dan Rutherford. Dr. Wilmer is an associate professional Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering and Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Pittsburgh, where he leads a research lab that explores the properties of hypothetical materials using computer simulations. He is also co-founder and co-managing editor of Ledger, the world's first academic journal dedicated to cryptocurrency research. The journal strives to serve both the general public and the cryptocurrency research community through the dissemination of high quality and timely scholarly content. Additionally, Dr. Dr. Wilmer co-authored a book called Bitcoin for the Befuddled. Mr. Dan Rutherford is the Associate Director of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission's Office of Customer Education and Outreach. The office designs and administers education initiatives to help market customers protect themselves from fraud or other violations of the Commodity Exchange Act. Prior to joining the CFTC, Mr. Rutherford was one of the first employees of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Office of Financial Education, where he wrote or edited the majority of the Bureau's financial education materials and led national financial education programs. In all, Mr. Rutherford has more than 25 years of personal finance writing and financial education experience, including being a founding member and editor of Kiplinger.com and as an associate director of FINRA's Office of Investor Education and the FINRA Foundation. You can also see more information about each of today's presenters on the event page. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's now my pleasure to th turn things over to Dr. Wilmer. <clears throat> Thank you, Selena. Um, hello, everyone. So, uh, it's my uh, pleasure and honor today to be able to talk about uh, what is cryptocurrency anyway. It's just a basic introduction to what Bitcoin is and what the various other cryptocurrencies are that you know share the sort of same fundamental things in common. Um, I will. Uh, this is a, a, a presentation for beginners. I'm going to try and cover a little bit of the technical details of how it works, but. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to assume any background knowledge. Um, just a very briefly about me, um, I learned about Bitcoin first in uh, September of 2011. There was a Wired Magazine article that came out at the time um, that kind of described Bitcoin as this failed experiment. Um, I was a graduate student at the time pursuing a PhD in chemical engineering at Northwestern University. Um, Bitcoins were about $3 each at the time, but they had been as high as $30 uh, earlier that summer. And that's why this Wired Magazine article said the bubble had burst, Bitcoin was over. Um, the damage had been done, Bitcoin will never go back above $17. 
Um, but the pessimism of the article kind of um, washed over me. The, the thing that I fixated on was that there was some throwaway sentence in there about how you could buy chocolates online with Bitcoin. And I had no idea, I just couldn't understand what this Bitcoin thing was, but I resolved that I would just try to buy those chocolates online, maybe buy them for my wife um, and, um, and teach myself what this Bitcoin thing was. Um, and so back then there, there really wasn't much you could buy uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, there were some people selling physical Bitcoins, um, uh, which you know had embedded on them the codes you could use to trade Bitcoins online, but they were sort of cute little you know coins you could put in your wallet and you could buy chocolate Bitcoins. So I was, I was trying to buy chocolate Bitcoins. Um, but it was, as you can imagine, it's, it's, you know, it's still somewhat complicated today. It was especially complicated back then. Um, just figuring out how to obtain Bitcoins was hard. Learning how to keep them safe was difficult. Um, I had to learn about cryptography and public and private keys. Um, and in doing all of this reading, just to try and get some Bitcoins to buy these chocolates, I learned way more than I really was set out to learn. And I, and I, and I eventually learned about this concept of a, of a brain wallet. It's actually possible to send Bitcoins from your phone or from your laptop to your brain. And those Bitcoins only exist in your mind. And then you can, and there, and you can delete them on every other device. And then you can send them from your mind back to your phone or your laptop. And, um, and for me, that was kind of an aha moment. Not a lot of people do that, but the fact that you could do that, I thought was kind of amazing. This idea of brain wallets, you know, clearly showed that there was something unique about Bitcoin and, and, and what later, you know, the, the common foundation is, is what we now call blockchain technology that you couldn't do before. So, you know, a, a common criticism at the time, I mean, there were many criticisms, uh, of Bitcoin back then and, and today, but you know, one of them is like, what's new? You know, we have money, but but this idea of the brain wallet meant that there was clearly something different. Um, so, um, at, you know, just as a point of context, at the end of 2012, Bitcoins were trading for about fifteen dollars. That was the market price, and, and they were still mostly known for just facilitating online drug sales via the you know this now defunct website called the Silk Road. Um, and in 2013, even as I was getting, you know, more excited about this technology as potentially transformative and very helpful, it was still a very widely misunderstood topic. And that's when myself and my co-author, Conrad Barsky, you know, wrote this book, Bitcoin for the Befuddled, to try and help explain, you know, the, the basics of how it worked, you know, why, why it was a potentially promising technology for the future. You know, even if it maybe had some, you know, negative side effects. Um, and during this time, the U.S. had its first Senate hearings where, where Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies were discussed. And it was almost immediately following those Senate hearings that the price went from fifteen dollars to thousand dollars, because I think a lot of people were expecting the discussion to be about how to ban Bitcoin. But it was actually fairly positive relative to people's expectations. You know, there was a lot of discussion among the senators about not trying to destroy this innovation while trying to also regulate it. Um, so along the same lines, when I when I became a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh, um, I helped start um, what is the world's now the world's first peer reviewed journal for publishing cryptocurrency research. We have a very broad scope. Um, thank you, Selena, for mentioning this. I won't go on about it, but um, it is it is free to read. Um, and so you're welcome to go to the website and, and to see what some latest research is on the subject. Okay, so back to the main question, what is Bitcoin or what is cryptocurrency? Um, I, think, I think the best, in my experience, I think the best way of understanding you know, what it is, is to go into a little bit of history as to how it came about and what was going through the minds of the inventors when they created it. So, a quote, a representative quote from the late 1990s um, comes from uh, Milton Friedman, a uh, Nobel Prize winning American economist, who, who said at the time, I think that the internet is going to be one of the major forces for reducing the role of government. The one thing that's missing, but that will soon be developed, is a reliable e-cash, a method whereby on the internet you can transfer funds from A to B 
without A knowing B or B knowing A. Um, and the main reason I mentioned this is just as a reminder that in the in the 90s, um, you know, the internet was becoming this growing thing, lots of, uh, you know, restaurants and uh, furniture stores had, you know, websites, and you could browse the menus and the furniture, but you couldn't pay for things online. And there were a lot of people working on ways to pay for things online. And, and this is a sort of quote is a, you know, historical evidence of that. And there's a funnier historical evidence of that. Um, because uh, the, you know, the 1990s, um, it was it was common to sort of lampoon, you know, tech entrepreneurs and internet pioneers who were claiming that the internet would take over the world and we would be doing everything on the internet. Um, and this was often seen as ridiculous. And there's this great article in Newsweek um, written by Clifford Stoll. I highly recommend you know reading it. It's a long article about how the internet was going to be a non you know a fad that will pass. But then there's this there's this great you know part in the middle, and, and I'll read it. Um, then there's the cyber business. We're promised instant catalog shopping, just point and click for great deals. We'll order airline tickets over the network, make restaurant reservations, and negotiate sales contracts. Stores will become obsolete. So how come my local mall does more business in one afternoon than the entire internet handles in a month? Even if there were a trustworthy way to send money over the internet, which there isn't, the network is missing a most essential ingredient of capitalism, salespeople. So it's, you know, it's just so funny reading this from 2021, you know, the year today, where in fact we are doing all of these things. You know, we, we are, we do buy our airline tickets online. We do make our restaurant reservations online. We do, we, you know, malls everywhere are going bankrupt. Um, and so, you know, everything Clifford Stoll said was, you know, wildly incorrect. But there was one thing he said that was true at the time, which is that you could not send money over the internet. It was not yet possible to pay for things with credit cards online, which is largely how we do it today. Um, so that was that was completely accurate. Um, and but all these people who said, well, we will buy things online, they were all working. And, and then we're talking about Microsoft, IBM, all the tech companies, universities at the time, they were all working on ways to pay for things online. Um, and the reason they were working on that is because it was believed at the time in the 1990s that you could not pay for things online using credit cards. Um, using credit cards to pay for things online was at the time seen as this insane non-starter and the reason is because when you use a credit card to buy something you give a merchant the person you're buying something from all of the information the exact information that then that merchant would need to go ahead and make purchases on your behalf right so it's, it would be a little bit like if you walked into a store and you said hello i'd like to buy toothbrush and then the merchant that you're talking to said that's five dollars and then you say okay here's my online bank password and all my login credentials just promise not to take more than five dollars okay and then the merchant says i promise that's that's how credit card could transactions work i mean that's how they worked for a very very long time you know, now that we're using the sort of chip on our credit cards it's a little bit different but that's a very recent change you know so all the way up and, and that by the way doesn't work for websites um, the chip. So credit card transactions, you know, for, for the most of our history um, and still to this day online, this is how it works. Except it's even worse when you do it online, because at least when you walk into a store, you're seeing the person who might cheat you from, you know, out of your money. Online, this was seen as this crazy thing to do because you were basically saying, hello, anonymous internet merchant, I'd like to buy a toothbrush. Sure, that's $5. Okay, here's my bank password and my login credentials. Just promise not to take more than five dollars. Okay, I promise. Um, I think Dan's actually going to, you know, later in this presentation is going to talk about, you know, the the changing perceptions of how safe it is to give out your credit card number online. But you know, in the '90s, um, this I mean, just think about this. This seems like a completely insane thing to do to a, to an anonymous person. Give them all your credit card information to buy something cheap and then they could turn around and use it to buy a car. So for that reason, 
there was no way you could buy anything online on the internet back then. Um, and, and a lot of uh, smart people, PhDs, entrepreneurs were trying to solve that problem. Um, one uh, one such person who I just mentioned as a again a sort of a representative case was David Chom. He got his PhD from Berkeley in computer science, and he was a cryptography researcher. And he developed this uh, a, a protocol for which you could buy things online that was very secure. It didn't suffer the the problems that credit cards did. It, you know the fundamental difference is it used this concept of digital signatures, which I don't have time to go into. Um, but he ended up spinning out a company called Digicash, um, and it you know the, it was worked most similarly to how maybe Venmo or PayPal uh, work today, um, except that you had to you know write a paper check to the Digicash company and so say you, you wrote them a check for hundred dollars, um, or maybe you use your credit card you know however but you 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 somehow gave them money and then they'd give you these points you know these eCash points. Um, and then you could spend these eCash points at participating merchants. And the good news was is that the, once you had eCash and once the merchants accepted eCash, um, everything from that point forward was very, very secure. Um, and then the company DigiCash kept track of all of its customers and all of the merchants and how much eCash they had. And if you wanted to trade back for US dollars, um, you know, it was a one to one thing. If you had $100 worth of eCash, you could trade that in for 100 US dollars that you could, you know, hold in your hand or have in your traditional bank account. Um, but DigiCash, you know, faced a lot of obstacles. Um, it was a startup, so it needed quick adoption because it had employees, you know, had an office building, had to pay rent. And consumers were very slow to adopt. Um, not only had DigiCash not earned their trust, but consumers at the time were still wrapping their head around the internet in the first place. It was very uncommon to buy things online. And um, DigiCash needed permission from all the financial regulatory agencies at you know municipal, state, federal levels. They wanted to be international, so they needed uh, permissions and following the various uh, rules of you know, just a large number of regular, regulatory agencies, which is fine, but it, it's a lot of work. Um, and um, kind of fundamentally, and this is sort of the, the key point here, is that it was unclear what would happen if DigiCash went bankrupt, right? If you, if you, if you went ahead and you trusted them and you gave them $1,000 and you got 1,000 eCash, what happens if DigiCash goes bankrupt? You know, what, what is it, do your eCash points mean anything at that point? And because they're a startup and startups go bankrupt all the time, even, you know, good ones that are doing good things, it's just that's the fact of life with startups. You know, meant that there's a very high likelihood that they could go bankrupt. And so just the perception, even if they're doing everything right, just the perception that they might go under meant that there was an enormous reluctance to use their technology because then, you know, you, you might lose all your money. And this is sort of the central point of failure problem. Um, Digicash was just one of many such efforts. There were many, many similar uh, Digicash-like companies in the 90s. Um, there, were, there were some competitors that tried to do something similar to DigiCash, but they, you know, kind of like Uber today, they tried to, um, what's the expression, um, not ask for permission, but ask for forgiveness. Uh, and they, did, they didn't They did get permission from the regulatory agencies. Um, but then the founders ended up going to jail um, for, for violating, you know, various rules, anti-money laundering laws and so forth. There was one such company called eGold. And I mean, I, you know, I don't I'd like to believe that the founders there were just trying to make this technology work, but, you know, they 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 broke some of the rules and, and it didn't end up well for them. OK, while all this chaos was going on with these eCash startups, these various eCash startups, um, Visa and MasterCard ended up more or less figuring out um, a way to facilitate uh, credit card payments online. But it was this very ugly brute force solution. Um, basically what they figured out, and this is still, this is still how it works to this day in 2021, is that Visa and MasterCard, they, they, they charge a, a significant fee. It could range from sort of three to five to upwards of 10% to the merchant on every transaction. And then that money is basically used to hire 
thousands of detectives um, and using pattern recognition and, and, and machine learning and all kinds of tricks to basically, whenever you buy something from a merchant, Visa and MasterCard watch those merchants like a hawk for the subsequent five years until your credit card expires, just to make sure they never abuse that privilege because you've given them, you know, all the information they need to then pretend to be you. Um, the only thing stopping them is that Visa and MasterCard watch them um, and, and scrutinize their activity to make sure they don't abuse that power. And it kind of works, but there are credit card numbers get stolen all the time, you know, so it's, it's still this big inefficient scandal today. Um, okay, but, but, but that is the way that we pay for things online. So those, you know, so all those eCash startups went bankrupt. Uh, we used credit cards. Um, and, then in the, and then in the late 2000s, this academic paper was distributed on this mailing list of, of cryptographers. And it was uh, titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And it was published anonymously or pseudonymously by this person, Satoshi Nakamoto who to this day, we don't know who this person is. But if you read the paper, and the paper's pretty short, um, you'll notice that all of its citations refer to the technologies and developments that were developed in the 90s. So it's very clear that Bitcoin came out of the research and the mindset and the idea of all of those people in the 90s that were trying to develop ways to pay for things on the internet before it ultimately went the way of credit cards. Um, and, and really Bitcoin works exactly the same as the technology that David Chom used for DigiCash or that was used for eGold. But it had one important difference. Um, whereas DigiCash, the company kept track of how many eCash points or eCash dollars everyone had on a central database, a central spreadsheet. Um, Bitcoin, um, the variation was it came up with a method or Satoshi came up with a method where it didn't require any single person to keep track of that spreadsheet. Instead, a sort of a network of volunteers, um, you know, each with their own copy of the spreadsheet could keep track of everyone's money. And because of this, um, it was just a set of rules that anyone could follow. It didn't require, it didn't have any central point of failure. There was no single person that was needed to run it. Um, and this can be a little bit hard to understand. Um, and there are a lot of fun analogies out there. I'm Canadian, so I'm partial to the sports analogy. Um, this uh, researcher at the University of Toronto, Yuri, wrote um, hockey. Okay, Bitcoin is like hockey. Hockey is just a collection of rules that describes a particular sport. Nobody owns the rules of hockey. And anyone can change the rules if they want to, as long as they don't mind playing by themselves. Um, it's possible for the rules of hockey to change, but only if everyone agrees to the new rules. And so Bitcoin is the same way. It's a set of rules that a computer program can follow. And if you follow them, anybody can participate in this uh, organized effort of keeping track of how many points, e-cash points, whatever you want to call them are. In, in Satoshi's case, he called them Bitcoins, but it doesn't matter. It's just an arbitrary uh, unit of account in this uh, distributed bookkeeping system. Okay, so the paper came out in 2008, and then in 2009, um, uh, you know, some source code, open source source code was developed, and people started sending back and forth to each other these worthless Bitcoins. I mean, it was just a computer science experiment at the time, basically. And what is widely believed to be one of the first commercial transactions uh, of Bitcoin was when a, some user on a forum named Laszlo, he said, if anybody orders me two pizzas, I will send them 10,000 Bitcoins. And this is the sort of the infamous Bitcoin pizza transaction because, you know, at the current market price that those are like $400 million pizzas. Um, but, um, but anyway, that was, you know, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's the point is that there were these sort of joke transactions initially, but then started slowly organically. People started treating these Bitcoins a little bit more seriously. Some entrepreneurs created 
currency exchanges where you could exchange you know, US dollars or euros or yen for Bitcoins. Um, and this is a price chart from you know, the early you know, 2010, 2011. So, you know, one Bitcoin was trading for 10 cents, 20 cents, 30 cents at the time. Um, but uh, today, um, you know, at, at least at, when I put the slide together, so it's not updated, it, you know, it trades at, you know, 40 to $50,000 per Bitcoin. And because the, because it's always all an open source code and an open source concept, um, people developed other cryptocurrencies, many of them that are literally identical to Bitcoin, just with a different name. Some of them, the rules are a little bit different. They do some things a little bit differently. But there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of these different cryptocurrencies and their market value in aggregate is over a trillion dollars. Um, which is pretty amazing, given the sort of the humble beginnings um, and the, you know, the sort of academic, you know, nature of sort of creating these sort of tokens, uh, you know, out of nothing. Um, one of the, so, so, you know, initially there was just Bitcoin. Um, and then when people copied Bitcoin and created other Bitcoin like things, uh, the word cryptocurrencies was thrown around a lot to, to describe the sort of the, the, the technology. Um, and around 2013, 2014, um, there was a, you know, people started realizing that the really core concept was that there was a way a decentralized way to maintain a database and that database could store any information it could be keeping track of how many points you know a group of people have that could be used as money let's say but it could be keep you know you could use it to keep track of uh, you know poetry or weather or whatever um and um and so that's when people started using the term blockchain technology because cryptocurrencies had this sort of financial connotation but blockchain technology you know which is really what we still call it today um conveys the idea that this is something that can have non-financial uses as well. Um, and, it, and today it is an active area of research and innovation. There are a lot of universities that have not just blockchain courses, but people are doing their PhDs and professors are doing research on blockchain and companies are doing research on, on blockchains and, and seeing, you know, what sort of social problems could it solve? What are interesting business opportunities? You know, how can the technology be made more efficient? Um, and so on. And, and some of that research comes our way at the journal ledger. Um, so in the, in the last few minutes of this presentation, I just wanted to um, uh, talk a little bit more about blockchain technology um, and how it is and what it is and, and how does it relate to Bitcoin? Because superficially, they seem like very different things. One is this payment technology that's, you know, maybe more secure than credit cards somehow. And blockchain technology is, is a database for just storing any information. Um, and, and, and then, you know, you may reasonably ask, well, why do we need a new way to store information? We have lots of ways of storing information already. Um, so just to quickly go over the different possibilities in a pedagogical way, you can store information on a piece of paper, any information, right? Um, typically, the reason that we um, use computers instead of papers is just more efficient. Um, you can search through millions of files in a fraction of a second. You can't do that with paper. Um, however, um, both paper and, a, a, you know, your laptop or a computer on your desk, you know, you could lose both of them in a, in a fire, right? So they, a single computer and paper both have the problem of resiliency. Um, and so we improved our data storage technologies so that they're more ro robust by having uh, many computers, you know, many databases in distributed geographical locations, and they're all synchronized, more or less just as efficient. But now if there's a fire in one place or a flood, um, you, you still maintain that data. And we use, if you use iCloud or Dropbox or something, um, you know, you're, you're taking advantage of this. However, even with Dropbox, if a hacker or, or or someone, or if, or if you just, or let's say you open some important document, uh, you delete a bunch of the important parts of it, and then you hit save. Um, the fact that you're on Dropbox doesn't necessarily save you because that error is then synchronized across all of those computers. And so it's possible for that data to be tampered with or for errors to be entered, you know, that 
unless you have some archiving solution, um, you know, can introduce problems. So there's an improvement on that as well. There's something called linked entry databases where they are tamper resistant. And I don't have time to really explain how they work, but they've been, the point is they've been around for a long time. They predate blockchain technology. So we have highly resilient, highly efficient, um, highly tamper proof and error resistant com computational databases um, that work really, really well. But all of these, all of these data storage technologies lack something and that's immutability. Um, because all of those other ways of storing data rely on a central administrator, someone who's in charge, um, that person is in charge if they wanted to, if that company wanted to, or that IT administrator wanted to, or if the person who just owned the paper files in a cabinet wanted to, you could delete all of that information. You could just chuck it all in the dumpster. Um, you could delete the files from all the, all the computers across all the databases. Because blockchains are databases that have no central administrator, um, they are a little bit less efficient, but there is no one who has the power to delete information. Once information is uploaded to a blockchain, it is there forever and no one can get rid of it. And so people have uploaded all kinds of unmentionable things to the Bitcoin blockchain and it is there forever because there just isn't a physical way of removing it from the blockchain. Um, my brother's wedding vows, he uploaded them to the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and now he's divorced, but in, there's nothing that can be done about that. Um, okay, so um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm reaching the end of my time, but I mean, just wanted to, to this is the this last point I want to sort of make, a, you know, um, is, is what is this connection between Bitcoin, the payment technology, and blockchain, this data storage technology? Um, Satoshi in his paper, didn't say here are two inventions, a blockchain and Bitcoin. They were the same thing. Um, he came, Satoshi, he or she came up with a method of keeping track of Bitcoins on this distributed ledger that we now call a blockchain. Even Satoshi didn't call it a blockchain. Satoshi just referred to it as this distributed, as this distributed ledger. Um, so Satoshi came up with it solely for the purposes of keeping track of who has how many Bitcoins, but that same ledger can be used to store any data and, and you don't need to invent a new blockchain. So like I said, my brother uploaded wedding vows on the Bitcoin blockchain. You didn't have to create a special wedding vows blockchain or an arbitrary text blockchain. You can upload any data to the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain or one of these other ones. Um, and the computers, the, um, and, and the reason that this is so robust is because um, this voluntary network of computers that maintains this database and makes sure that it's always synchronized, um, they get paid to do that. Um, you may have heard of Bitcoin miners. Um, you know, we don't have enough time to talk about all the, the, all the everything about Bitcoin mining. But it's a common misconception that, Bitcoin, that the point of Bitcoin mining is creating Bitcoins. The point of Bitcoin mining is to keep that database synchronized. And it's just as a side effect that those, those people who volunteer, so to speak, to keep the database uh, properly synchronized, that they get paid in Bitcoins for doing so. And we call those people miners. Um, Although we shouldn't, we probably should be, you know, it would have been more helpful if they were called like Bitcoin bookkeepers or something. Um, but the point of mining is not just to create Bitcoins or finding Bitcoins. The point is to keep the database synchronized. Um, and so, and so, you know, that's why the Bitcoin network and other cryptocurrencies and blockchains have a hundred percent uptime because there has never been a point where, you know, at, you know, where there hasn't been at least a few people willing to keep their computers and servers online to maintain the Bitcoin network, because if they turn their computers off, they would lose out on that income. Um, and so, so it's, uh, it's probably the most, you know, empirically, 
it is probably the like a, an online data storage technology with the most uptime you know that's never been down you know more than any other uh, data storage technology um okay so let me just see here um okay so where might blockchain technology be useful um it's uh, this is something I think that as a society we're still exploring, but it's important um, that we don't use it in places where everyone trusts each other. In, in those cases, uh, you don't need a blockchain. It's it it's uh, it's really the the places where blockchain technology as a data storage technology is useful is where there's no appropriate neutral custodian uh, for storing data that everybody trusts. And I think like a an interesting example of this would be say domestic versus international patent disputes. So you could upload, you know, the description of an invention to a blockchain. Um, and if you think about, for example, the situation where maybe there are two American inventors that both invent something at the same time, more or less, like, you know, within a week of each other, and they both um, submit their inventions, their patents to the US Patent Office, we can believe um, that the US Patent Office will be impartial in judging who really came up with that idea first as a fair judge, um, you know, who should be known as the person who has the rights to this invention. But let's suppose there's an American inventor that files their patent to the American Patent Office and a Chinese inventor, at, you know, more or less simultaneously, who files their patent to the Chinese Patent Office. Um, is it believable that the American Patent Office and the Chinese Patent Office will both be impartial and and work out between each other who really was first, or do we suspect that they might each favor their own domestic inventor? This is a situation where there is a lack of a central data custodian that everybody trusts. Even if everyone is honest, there can still be a fundamental uh, mistrust just due to the um, the incentive structure being you know inappropriate for that situation. If both, of, if both the American inventor and the Chinese inventor instead uploaded their patent to a blockchain, the blockchain is a neutral because the blockchain doesn't care. The blockchain, you know, you have cryptographic proof of who uploaded it first. It's completely incontrovertible. Um, so that's like a logical place where blockchain technology might be better than the way we currently do things for patents, for example. Um, other examples is a custodian could be well-meaning and maybe everyone trusts that custodian on, on one level, but maybe is unreliable. So for example, I love Dropbox um, and I'm happy to use Dropbox, you know, day to day, but as a startup company, I don't know that Dropbox will be around in 20 years. Whereas I am hundred percent sure that if I uploaded an important document to the Bitcoin blockchain, I'm absolutely sure it'll be there in 20 years um, because there isn't that sense, you know, Dropbox could go bankrupt, Bitcoin cannot go bankrupt by, by design. Um, there are also interesting cases where data custodians could cheat when the stakes are high. Um, so there are unfortunately cases of doctors revising patient records to avoid being sued in insurance claim cases. Sometimes, again, unfortunately, there, there have been cases where police um, delete evidence you know, from their evidence lockers or their databases that's inconvenient for some sort of case. Again, because in a blockchain, it's impossible to delete anything. Um, if the if medical records were on a blockchain, if evidence, as soon as it was obtained by police, was put into a, you know into a blockchain, there's zero ability for those institutions to then go back and tamper with or remove that data. For better or worse, I mean, these are all double-edged swords. Um, okay. I, I, I've taken up more than my share of the time, so I'm going to uh, go to questions um, and take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilmer. We've got one question in the chat. Oh, I see. Uh, from Norman. Bitcoin is one type of cryptocurrency, but I've heard about Ethereum and Litecoin. What are the differences? Um, so I um, said Bitcoin a lot in this in presentation, and the reason I did that wasn't because uh, Bitcoin is is my favorite or anything. It's just that Bitcoin was first, and most cryptocurrencies are almost identical to Bitcoin. 
they vary in mostly insignificant ways. So for example, um, uh, Norma or Norman perhaps mentioned Litecoin. Litecoin is virtually identical to Bitcoin. Um, the differences are almost not worth talking about. It's just different in name. Um, and then Ethereum is an example of a cryptocurrency that is still substantially similar, but um, but does have a meaningful difference. So, and um, the the main difference is there is that when you broadcast a Bitcoin transaction from your computer um, you know, using open source software, you know, it's not like there's no Bitcoin company you have to ask for the software. You sort of download some some software you can attach to your Bitcoin transaction some simple instructions. So for example, you can send someone Bitcoins and the, the simple instructions could say, um, this transaction is only valid after a certain time, right? So that person, it's sort of like a post-dated check. Um, or for example, you could send Bitcoin transactions that, that require two people to sign for them, right? So you have to use your digital signature and then maybe your wife has to apply her digital signature and only then is that Bitcoin transaction valid. But however, these instructions are very restricted. You can only do these simple things like post dating or multi signatures. Um, and the people who in invented Ethereum said, why don't we relax those restrictions and basically any computer program that you wanted to attach to the transaction um, you you can you can attach it there and um and so um you can basically have a really really long and detailed contract attached to a transaction that's re really uh, limited up to your imagination in an ethereum transaction you could say if the weather is hot in georgia you know based on the data provided by this particular weather station um you, you know and um it's um you know, and there's this particular music station is playing this music, then this transaction is valid. Otherwise, this transaction is invalid. And that might seem like a silly example, but um, a lot of people are excited about Ethereum because you can build in these self-executing uh, business contracts, essentially. And you could basically send someone money that only becomes valid if they fulfill their end of the contract, building a deck or a house or, or whatever. Um, Okay, should I read some of the other questions? Well, we will go ahead and move on to Mr. Rutherford and then we'll okay. come back to questions at the end, given sure. time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Dan, go ahead, Dan. Thank you, Dr. Wilmer, and, and thank you all for inviting me uh, to be here today. There we go. Uh, before getting started, I must read the following disclaimer. Uh, this presentation is provided for the general informational and educational purposes only and does not provide legal or investment advice, guidance, or interpretation to any individual or entity. Uh, the views presented herein are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission or the commissioners. References to any product, services, or resources or the use of any entity, organization, trade, firm, or corporation name does not constitute or imply endorsement, recommendation, or favoring by the CFTC or the United States government. The CFTC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information contained in third-party resources or websites referenced herein. My name is Dan Rutherford, and I'm the Associate Director of Customer Outreach in the CFTC's Office of Customer Education and Outreach. Over the next 30 minutes or so, I'll be discussing the growth of virtual currencies and related fraud, the CFTC's role in protecting the public from these frauds, what we're seeing now in terms of fraud types and trends, where to report fraud, and I'll wrap up by sharing some additional resources that you might find useful as you continue to learn about digital assets and fraud. So let's start by taking a look at the growth of virtual currencies and fraud. Uh, history demonstrates that when there are opportunities to make money and a lopsidedness of know-how and few safeguards, fraud follows. And that's certainly been the, the case when it comes to digital assets. In May, the FTC reported that it had received nearly 7,000 complaints to its consumer Sentinel network database between October 2020 
in May 2021. This was more than 10 times the amount of fraud reports from the same period one year ago, and a 1,000% increase in the amount of losses. The actual amount of fraud is likely much higher, and I say this for a couple of reasons. First, fraud is commonly underreported by fraud victims. And second, the FTC data only includes reports from agencies that contribute to the FTC Sentinel Fraud Network, which includes a number of state attorneys general and law enforcement agencies, but does not include complaints received by the CFTC, SEC, FINRA, or the National Futures Association. The CFTC does not publicly release complaint statistics, but I can say we have seen an unprecedented increase in complaints involving virtual currencies over the past two years. The vast majority of, uh, of these frauds have been online fee frauds, which I'll talk a, a little bit uh, in more detail later in the presentation. There are, are a few forensic uh, software companies that track virtual currency related crime and their data show that overall, legitimate virtual currency activity is far outpaced frauds and scams. In 2020, frauds and scams made up 0.34% of all cryptocurrency transactions, which amounted to an estimated 10 billion in losses that year. Virtual currency crimes actually fell fairly significantly in 2020 from 2019 levels. But there are some troubling trends, mainly in the areas of DeFi or decentralized finance applications, ransomware, and a greater number of frauds targeting individuals. Ransomware accounted for just 7% of all funds received by criminal addresses at just under $350 million worth of cryptocurrency, but that figure represents a 311% increase over 2019. And again, these numbers are likely underreported. One reason we saw the overall amount of virtual currency crimes decline was because there were no major Ponzi schemes in 2020 and, and far fewer hacks of centralized trading platforms. Instead, over half the hacks in 2020 were on DeFi applications and fraudsters are targeting individuals more than larger entities. So let's take a minute to consider who owns or will buy virtual currencies. Uh, a couple of caveats here. The CFTC did not conduct these surveys. And if you search the web, you're going to find all sorts of figures representing different populations or demographic segments. I've tried to draw apples to apples comparisons here as best I could. Uh, the first set of data is from Gemini, which is a virtual currency cash market trading platform. I don't like to use the term exchange because they're not registered as exchanges or regulated like other exchanges. Anyway, according to Gemini, about 14% of working age Americans ages 18 to 65 own cryptocurrency. That's roughly 21 million people. Now, this is still a, a fairly small minority of the population, but keep in mind that a Harris Poll survey from October 2017 put Bitcoin ownership at 2% of the population. And this was roughly the same time that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange launched its Bitcoin futures contracts. So over the course of three years, from 2017 to 2020, ownership has grown about 12%. Again, that's not explosive growth. But if you, can, if you consider that stock ownership in the U.S. has hovered around 50% over the same period of time, maybe shifting a point or two here or there, it's fairly significant. Most virtual currency owners are between the ages of 25 and 44. So we're talking about millennials and Gen Xers, and this age cohort is right near wheelhouse. In terms of gender, the distribution is mostly male, 74% male, 26% female. And 69% of owners of virtual currency or view cryptocurrency as a buy and hold investment. People aren't buying uh, virtual currency to spend. Right or wrong, they're buying it as an investment. According to Ascent, a research arm of The Motley Fool, 51% of current owners purchase their cryptocurrency within the past 12 months, and 20% of non owners say they are likely to buy some over the next year. In terms of physical presence, we're seeing significant growth in Bitcoin ATMs, both in the US and around the world. 
but the vast majority of growth is here in the US. Out of the 26,100 Bitcoin ATMs worldwide, 22,600 are here in the United States. And that's a 200% increase over last year. Okay, so audience participation time. Um, in a second, many of you will see a pop-up poll. Uh, if you don't see the pop-up poll, feel free to put your responses in the chat box. Uh, so how many current virtual currency owners, these are people that currently own cryptocurrency, have little to no understanding of how virtual currency works? 5%, 15%, 35%, or 55%. I'll give you a few minutes to answer. Okay, well, it looks like a lot of people thought 55%. Well, okay, they're not quite that high. The answer is 35%, just more than a third of the owners have little to no understanding of how virtual currency actually works. And this is a big part of the fraud problem. And you all know this. Anytime consumers enter into trades with someone who knows more about the product or the service or the market than they do, they're at a serious disadvantage. And that's definitely the case here. So we have our work cut out for us. People see the headlines and they hear about people making a lot of money at this. Uh, and then they're approached by someone online who says they can make them rich too. Well, that has a certain amount of appeal. And, and in, you know, when you hear people who invested at 15 and it's now worth $40,000, it's not outside the realm of possibility. It's not, suddenly, you know, too good to be true maybe sounds good enough to be real. Um, remember too that at its core, virtual currencies were designed to be completely peer-to-peer, -peer, removing intermediaries like payment processors, banks, and governments, institutions that commonly spot, stop, investigate, and prosecute fraud. For virtual currency enthusiasts, this disintermediation is a feature, not a bug. And the other uh, design features of virtual currency have made them the latest favorite among fraudsters, including their transferability. Payments of virtual currencies can be sent anywhere in the world as easily as sending an email. They're immutable. Transactions can't be reversed. For example, once a Bitcoin transaction is entered into the blockchain, it can't be changed, disputed, stopped, or recovered. They're pseudonymous. Uh, they obscure real-world identities. Although the software can trace transactions and identify criminals' public keys, Criminals can make it nearly impossible to connect the keys to their true identities. And they can be quickly convertible to cash or goods. Bitcoin and other virtual currencies can be easily exchanged for fiat currency, which can be moved to banks or withdrawn as cash. In short, virtual currency users can transfer irretrievable amounts of money, in some cases, sizable amounts of wealth, to people they can't truly identify and who could be operating anywhere in the world. Criminals can hide the money or convert it quickly to cash and goods. And there are little to no customer protections. So now I'd like to quickly touch on the CFTC's role in the virtual currency space. But before I do, let's take another poll question. There we go. Um, so if you see the pop-up poll, go ahead and, and uh, select your answer there. If you don't, go ahead and put it in the chat box. Uh, but digital assets, are virtual currencies, smart contracts, tokens, et cetera, are they commodities, securities, derivatives, all of the above, or you have no idea? Go ahead and put your answers in the chat box or respond to the poll. Let's see what everybody thinks. Oh, good. Okay, we got a good mix there. Um, looks like a slight majority says all of the above, and that is the correct answer. Um, they're all of the above and more. Um, 
The fact of the matter is that these are new technologies. Digital assets, uh, as Dr. Wilmer expressed, are not monolithic. Um, a Bitcoin transaction can be a, and a smart contract are not the same thing. So it really boils down to the facts and circumstances of how the token or offer is put together, how the tokens are used, how they're promoted, how, uh, how they return value, et cetera. So for the most part, it, it really just depends on, on how it's uh, put together. Um, a few virtual currencies, including Bitcoin and Ether, have been determined to be commodities. But there are thousands of tokens out there and, and more being developed every day. And so that leaves us with a team approach uh, to regulating these products, products and markets. At present, um, we have a blended regulatory framework that includes a number of federal and state agencies, including the CFTC and the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Reserve, the Department of Treasury, which also includes the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the IRS, and the Financial Crimes Enforce Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, among others. Um, as of now, the CFTC has the ability to bring enforcement actions when it suspects fraud or manipulation in virtual currency cases, but neither us nor the SEC presently has the ability to oversee or supervise the trading platforms or require disclosures or other customer protection measures. These authorities would have to be legislated, and right now I believe there are nearly 20 bills or so involving di digital asset regulation pending in Congress. But until those bills become laws, we have to use this team approach, which isn't unique to digital assets. There are also some derivatives that are co-regulated by the CFTC and the SEC. When Congress created the CFTC in 1974, it gave the agency two distinct authorities. The first was regulatory authority over US derivatives markets, which include commodity futures, options, and swaps. So we can make, uh, we can make rules and supervise those markets. We were also given enforcement authority over the derivatives markets and a broader application for anti-fraud and anti-manipulation authority with respect to cash commodities. Remember, derivatives like futures are all tied to an underlying asset. When you trade derivatives, you trade contracts, not the assets themselves. Buying and selling in the cash markets, say when a farmer sells corn to a grain elevator, it's not regulated by the CFTC, but trading in corn futures is. The same is true with virtual currencies. We regulate Bitcoin futures or Ether futures on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, but we do not regulate the buying and selling of these coins in the cash market on platforms like Gemini or Coinbase. However, the CFTC does maintain its general anti-fraud and manipulation enforcement authority over virtual currency as a commodity in interstate commerce. Okay, let's do one more question. How do virtual currency uh, frauds commonly start? Social media buzz, spam email, cold calls, all of the above. And again, uh, answer the pop-up poll or put your answers in the chat. Look at the answers in a second. All of the above. Well, that's that's uh, for the most part true. I mean, there are some uh, 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 spam emails and cold calls, but uh, generally, I'm trying to uh, get my slide to move forward here. Excuse me. Um, uh, the answer is generally social media. So there are uh, phishing attempts and ransomware and in email blackmail frauds. But the biggest category of frauds that we see are investment frauds that begin in social media. And if you consider the four phases of fraud, it's understandable. So when a fraud occurs, uh, it steps through four distinct phases. The first phase is exposure. And this is just being in the marketplace. This is asking questions or doing research and just being out there. Um, the next phase is targeting. 
And that's when you're spotted by the fraudster and they begin to size you up or choose you out of the crowd for, because of certain traits. Um, next comes engagement, and this is the sales pitch. Uh, this is when the conversation happens. And the last phase is victimization when the money is lost. And social media uh, enables all of that to happen. So fraudsters can make up fake profiles that can participate in group discussions or message boards and connect one-on-one -on -one with fraud targets. Right now, we're seeing a big uptick in dating app-related frauds. And again, this is something that could be impacting service members right now. Um, romance scams aren't new, but this new variation is targeting a much younger group, uh, men and women in their 20s and 30s, and are convincing people to send Bitcoin to trade digital assets or foreign exchange. Um, these frauds originated in Asia, but have spread and are now hitting North America um, pretty heavily. Um, the scammers groom their victims for weeks or months. Uh, they're always some distance away. They're usually claimed to be business owners or executives who travel uh, extensively and talk about spending money like it's no big deal. Then eventually, uh, they start to ask how much the victim makes or if they'd like to make more money. And if they're interested, you know, they can teach them how to trade. Or they may have an uncle or a brother or a friend or someone who can trade for them. When the victim puts up a few hundred dollars, uh, they'll, uh, they'll put together a trading plan and show the victim sizable you know, returns. Then they'll start to push them to stake a larger and larger amounts into the fraud. And when the victim wants to take the profits, the love interests get angry and push them to invest more. And when the victim finally objects, the fraudster, the trading website, the uncle, all of that disappears and the money disappears with them. And people are losing tens of thousands of dollars to these scams. And we've seen a large number of these just within the past several months. Um, these frauds are well organized. Um, and like I said, they've, they've started in, uh, in Asia and in the Pacific uh, areas of you know, Australia and, and New Zealand and are now making their way uh, into North America. So what are the warning signs uh, when it comes to these social media and other types of scams? Uh, the first is uh, they want to take the conversation off the platform to Telegram or some other messaging app. And this allows the fraudsters to evade detection by the social media and dating platforms. Many of these platforms have algorithms that detect harmful language, including fraud, and conversations on uh, messaging apps can be easily deleted. Uh, it's easy for fraudsters to hide their, their true location from victims or authorities. So remind your troops that if they're using dating apps or social media to, uh, to stay on those platforms. And when they move to Telegram or WhatsApp or Snapchat, you know, they're heading into more dangerous waters. Next, the fraudster claims to be a cryptocurrency advisor or broker or knows someone who can make trades for you. There's no such thing as a registered cryptocurrency advisor or broker. Unlike the commodity futures or securities markets where financial professionals must complete thorough background checks, pass required proficiency tests, adhere to disclosure requirements and standards of conduct and register with federal and state regulators, uh, there are no such safeguards in these cryptocurrency cash markets. If the only way you communicate is online or you're trading through a friend of a friend, you have no idea to whom you're giving, you're really giving your money. Next, uh, people can't withdraw their money. Uh, and this refers to the fee frauds that I mentioned earlier. Typically these frauds start by claiming that if you send in a hundred dollars of Bitcoin, they'll turn it into a thousand dollars. Or if you give them $500, they'll turn it into $5,000 and all in a matter of weeks. When a victim pays the money, they're shown returns that exceed expectations. But when they try to withdraw the money, they first have to pay a 10% commission. So they pay the commission. Then they have to pay a 15% tax and so on, one fee after another until they realize they're getting scammed. Then all communications stop. 
This has been one of the most common complaints the CFTC has received over the past few years. Of course, the oversized returns were never real. They were simply used to lure, uh, to get the victims to pay more, more and more fees. Uh, there are various levels of investment required. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the more money you commit, the more you're guaranteed in return. Newfound friends or romantic interests may get victims to start small and then encourage them to invest more and more to achieve gold or VIP status. Remember, it doesn't matter how much money you hand over. There's no such thing as a guaranteed investment or a risk-free risk trading strategy. Cryptocurrency prices are highly volatile. Not displaying or disclosing a headquarters address or phone number on the trading website, or the business is located outside the United States, or displays a fake address or a WhatsApp phone number. What I like to tell people is, before providing any personal information or money, do a virtual visit. Do a map search on the headquarters address and take a look at the street view. Is the address real? Does it look like a legitimate place of business? You'd be surprised how many trading platforms are run out of vacant lots and storage units. Another tip, verify that the trading platform is registered as a money service business with FinCEN or with a nationwide multi-state licensing system operated by the Conference of State Bank Supervisors. Oops, let me back. The best advice is never trust your money to someone who is not a registered advisor or broker. And if someone claims to be registered, check. If you go to cftc.gov slash check, the link, uh, the link there in the second bullet, uh, there's a drop down section that talks about checking out virtual currency trading platforms and contains the links to FinCEN and the nationwide multi state licensing system I mentioned earlier. So let's talk a little bit about DeFi scams. And again, I don't want to get too in the weeds on this. Um, and Dr. Wilmer mentioned, talked a little bit about the Ethereum network and how you know, that's a little bit different than the blockchain network. So for background, the decentralized finance takes the decentralization of blockchain technology to the next level. Uh, most DeFi applications run on the Ethereum blockchain, which compared to Bitcoin blockchain uh, allows for much more information to be recorded. The Ethereum blockchain can re can record entire software applications that run on smart contract technology. Decentralized applications or dApps can run independently or together with other dApps to create new, more complex decentralized services such as decentralized exchanges or lending applications. The novel snap together technology also means that virtual currencies, tokens, and projects can be created with greater and greater speed. And poorly or maliciously built software can lead to significant losses. We're seeing significant increases in DeFi hacks and exit scams. They've sort of replaced the ICO scams we saw a few years ago. Now, instead of calling itself an ICO, a developer or a group of developers talk up their new DeFi project or application, issue coins and start hyping the project on social media. When enough interest builds through token sales or pooled investments, the, the scammers uh, pull up stakes and disappear with the money. The programmers could also build in back doors or hackers could simply exploit a vulnerability and break in. Be mindful of FOMO, the fear of missing out. A lot of, there's a lot of hype around a new project. That should be a warning sign. Also keep in mind that new or thinly traded tokens can be easily manipulated. The scammers may be pumping the price of the coin while hyping it at the same time to build excitement. Check project websites or white papers to see if the software has been audited by, a third, by third party programs or third party companies rather, or tested for bugs and vulnerabilities. But again, be aware that this is a new technology, even audited software can be hacked and tests are only as good as the test writers. But really the main thing is invest only with risk capital. And this is money that you can afford to lose, not money needed for things like living expenses, emergencies, or longer term needs like retirement.
The bottom line, invest in what you know. Only get involved with projects you fully understand. And that includes the code, the component applications, the protocols, and the networks, if possible. If you don't understand it, you have no reason to buy it. Uh, some other common scams that we see, uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, from 2019 to 2020, ransomware attacks reportedly tripled and recently caused uh, shutdowns in the meatpacking and uh, energy supply chains. And while attacks that uh, are against big companies get big headlines, ransomware attacks started against individuals and in some cases still do. Uh, ransomware attacks occur when hackers infiltrate a device or an organization's network and instill malicious software that encrypts critical files or systems, making them unusable. Hackers then contact the victim and demand payment, commonly in Bitcoin, to decrypt the files. Attackers may also threaten to release or sell data if the ransom isn't paid. Ransomware hackers commonly exploit phishing attacks or outdated security software. So to avoid them, you know, make sure you're updating um, and be careful of, of uh, uh, your email. Um, cloned trading sites or apps, fraudsters will copy popular brands or web designs to trick customers into sending them Bitcoin or other virtual currencies. To avoid cloned websites and phishing emails, start by examining who the email is from, including scrutinizing the email address. Spelling errors or other mistakes are also common red flags. Don't click links or use QR codes in the email. Instead, search for the customer service information for your provider on your own and verify if the email request is legitimate with a customer service agent. Fraudulent apps that mimic virtual currency wallet software or hardware brands have also been found in mobile app stores. When users enter their credentials into the fraudulent apps, their virtual currency is stolen and sent to the fraudsters. To avoid, to avoid fraudulent apps, start with the official website for your hardware or software wallet, trading platform, or other financial service provider to see if it offers a mobile app. If so, use the official app link provided on the company website. Another thing you should do is check customer reviews carefully. Previous customers may provide warnings. If you spot a, uh, and if you spot a fraudulent app, report it to the app store immediately. Next are imposter frauds. Uh, imposter frauds exploit the trust people have in government officials or law enforcement. Uh, victims are often contacted by phone or email and told that uh, they must make an immediate payment of some sort. Uh, sometimes these calls or emails will threaten arrest or additional pay penalties if payments aren't made. Uh, a government agency will never demand immediate payment and would never ask you to pay with Bitcoin. If you receive an email, look at the email domain or uh, any links that are provided. All government websites and email addresses end in .gov or .fed.us, and only government agencies can get those domain extensions. If someone calls you claiming to be from the government, write down the pertinent information, but don't confirm your personal information, including your social security number, and the call, then call the agency using the contact information on its official website. Next are recovery frauds. Recovery frauds are a form of advanced fee fraud that target victims that have already been harmed by other frauds. Commonly, a victim receives a phone call or an email from a person claiming to be a government official, an attorney, or a recovery service representative. And in most cases, the fraudsters claim to have the money already in hand or they're working with the court to distribute the funds. But first, you need to send them you know, a tax or a fee or a retainer or some form of donation. Uh, again, um, these are probably you know, the worst of the worst right here. And generally what happens is once you're victim to one fraud, the same organization will hang on to your information and just contact you a few weeks later. So if you if you're ever um, are talking to folks that have been victimized by frauds, that should be your first warning to them is watch out for recovery frauds. If you suspect fraud, two things to keep in mind. One, don't pay any more money. And that may sound like a no brainer, but again, keep in mind the fee frauds that I mentioned earlier. You should never have to pay to get your money. Second, report it. Um, you can report it to the CFTC, 
the uh, DOJ's Internet Crime Complaint Center, IC3.gov, uh, the FTC, the SEC, your state regulator, or attorney general. And lastly, uh, here are some resources that uh, you can use to learn more uh, about um, Bitcoin and virtual currencies and, and uh, frauds in this area. And with that, I will wrap it up. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford, for sharing a bunch of great information and good resources. And a lot of those resources you shared at the end goes back to one of our questions that we had earlier too, looking at information they can share with service members. So I would say, you know, a lot of these are a good place to start since most personal financial managers would just be sharing kind of the basic tenets of crypto investing. Definitely good information on the um, scams and fraud side of that as well. So we've had a lot of questions come in through the chat pod. Some of them are really outside of the scope of our webinar. But, you know, thinking through a couple of these, they bring up a few good points too. When one person from the Navy asked, you know, so what can you purchase with Bitcoin? I hear there's many Bitcoin millionaires. What is really the net worth, the wealth of that person? And I think that brings up even a further discussion when you're thinking about it from that PFM perspective, working with service members. And, you know, we're thinking about net worth and, you know, the ability to, for example, thinking about our assets and to obtain a future loan, for example. Can either of you speak on what that looks like from that side? I'm not sure I understand the question uh, no. regarding net worth, net worth. So I would garner to say, and I'm not an expert on cryptocurrency by any means, but any loan application I've seen does not really take cryptocurrency into consideration. No. When you're oh. looking at that net worth. Yeah, when my, when, my, when my wife and I bought our house, you know, we had, you know, again, it gave you my history, right? I, the bitcoins I got were for three dollars each. So by the time you know, a few years later, when we were buying a house, we had a significant assets in Bitcoin, and um, we didn't know whether that counted for anything when getting a mortgage. Um, but actually, the uh, the mortgage broker I spoke to, this is in Pittsburgh, and I, I think this is going to be very heterogeneous and very you know. He said that actually I was the first person who had mentioned having Bitcoin assets to him, and he went on and he said he did a flurry of activity. And I, he, I think, you know, he's trying to now, you know, five, six years later for that to count as an asset when, when getting loans, you know, as, as a factor when, when getting loans. I, I imagine that will matter in the future. I mean, it's, it's even if it, some people ignore it now, um, it, it, you know, it, if there are millionaires and billionaires, but, you know, have cryptocurrency assets and you could use it to buy islands and, and whatnot, then for sure it's going to be, I think in the future, uh, as a non-expert on this issue, you know, something that would be taken into account just like any other asset for people's net worth calculations. Yeah, I mean, I would just add that I, I think a lot of banks are looking at this and a lot of regulators are also looking at this and in terms of what is the bank's involvement and what are the overlaps with uh, the virtual currencies uh, markets. Uh, but I think a lot of that is to be determined. I think if you're you know, trying to determine net worth or, or uh, you know, as, as a pure calculation, just as a, you know, personal understanding of your personal finances, you know, look at the current market value. But, you know, again, these are very volatile assets that can change dramatically, you know, month to month. So that's something to also keep in mind. And until you, you actually transfer that back to a fiat currency or something that's a little bit more stable, those numbers can be fairly liquid. Thank you. Lots of considerations there. And there was a comment, and you know, this is kind of leading to that, that we don't know what will come, but if it does become where cryptocurrency is more to be the means to purchase goods and services, Chris had asked, would you expect the FDIC to eventually insure that? Uh, well, again, and this is just looking at it, I'm, I do not work with the FDIC, although, you know, I do try to stay current on where things are with different regulations. I know they are looking at various aspects of 
uh, what banks can do and, and insurability has been an issue, although I can't really comment on what, you know, their future policy goals might look like. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Selena to wrap us up and let you know about our future webinars. Thank you so much to both of our presenters and to all of you who contributed to the conversation in the chat. Um, I want to go ahead and invite you to our next event, the psychology of money, understanding service members financial decisions. That webinar is October 19th and will focus on behavioral finance and the impact of psychology on clients financial decisions with an emphasis on building trust, being authentic with clients and an introduction of communication essentials that can be applied directly in practice. So if you would like to go ahead and RSVP for that event, I will share that link in the chat right now. Um, CEUs will be available for that webinar. I just went ahead and shared that one in the chat with you. If you are interested in CEUs for this webinar, this session is approved for one and a half CEU credits for AFCs and CPFCs, uh, we, as well as um, CFLEs. So we also offer a certificate of completion. Please just click on the link for the evaluation on the event page through the purple continuing education button. We'll post that in the chat as well. Um, while completing the evaluation, we would sincerely appreciate any specific suggestions you have for future webinar topics that could be used directly in your work with service members. At the end of the evaluation, you'll also be able to choose the correct link for your accreditation and then be directed to a 10 question um, post test. So once you pass the post test with 80% or higher, you'll receive a certificate of completion by email. Please make sure to click all the way through to the end of that survey to receive your certificate. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me at selinah at ufl.edu. Um, let me go ahead and just share that link for today's webinar in the chat with you as well. So that's where you will go for CEUs. I also invite you to subscribe to our monthly newsletter that comes out on the first of each month. It shares upcoming webinars so that you can get those events on your calendar, as well as an article related to timely financial issues. We would also love for you to join us on Twitter at MFLNPF. And now I will turn things back over to my colleague, Coral Owen. Thanks so much, Selena. I want to echo Selena's thanks to Dr. Gillen for moderating today's session, as well as uh, to our speakers today, Dr. Wilmer and Mr. Rutherford. So appreciate your expertise and time. As Selena mentioned, the uh, continuation, excuse me, continuing education for today's webinar is available via the purple continuing education button on the event page. Also another quick note regarding the event page, that's the one stop shop for today's webinar. So if you would like to download the slides that we went through today, you can find those under the event materials section. And additionally, if you would like to share the recording of this webinar with any colleagues or go back and review this information, uh, the recording will be posted to the event page as well within the next business day or two. So thanks again for joining us. We hope to see you again in another Military Families Learning Network webinar soon. Uh, take care and thanks again for joining us. If the evaluation link, it should be working, I just double checked it. Uh, if you have any questions regarding that evaluation and continue education uh, process, you can reach out to Selena for assistance, selena h at ufl.edu. I'll post her email in the chat for your convenience. And if you've had that event page open, you may just need to refresh that browser window to access as we do update the webinar with that link uh, during the session itself.
All right, we're going to go ahead and close out the room again. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any follow-up questions, and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day.